Hello, you beautiful interweb folk and beyond. Welcome to another fine episode of The Imposter. That's right, the podcast dedicated to making science more fun and enjoyable for you, the audience. Anyway, so today we have the very, very wonderful and very, very brilliant Dr. Claire Embling on the show. And she is a lecturer at Plymouth University um, that deals with marine ecology. And essentially today we're going to be discussing a few different things. It's a very interesting uh, episode. Um, we are talking about cetaceans, so, you know, like dolphins, porpoises, whales. Um, we're going to be talking about possibly other marine vertebrates, but also um, we're going to be discussing the impact of renewable energies like wind farms and, and tidal energy um, on the marine environment, uh, something that I definitely didn't really think about uh, until until this discussion. We're also going to be talking about marine protected areas and also uh, citizen science, so science that gets the general public involved, which, you know, after all, as you can imagine, I, I really support. I think it's pretty cool. Um, so I have gotten some feedback uh, recently that some of the episodes are a bit too long. By some, I mean the first two. And so what I'm going to do right now is just put just put one, one tiny snippet of one subject that we cover. It's going to be the impact of marine renewables, just to, just to hook you in, you know what I'm saying? Just to let you know what you're missing. But we discuss many other interesting things. So just in case you need that little extra hook, here's a preview. I mean, a lot of these wind farms are very big as well, so it's, it's, it's kind of um, a double issue. It takes a while to put the pile in in the first place. I mean, you're talking about wind farms now, which are over 100 turbines. You're doing pile driving for quite a long period of time. Yeah. So you think about that noise going into the marine environment. It's kind of like a big bang constantly. And it's been shown to displace porpoises, for example, hmm. which are in these habitats, because they're mostly in a shallow water habitat, which is prime habitat for porpoises. Right. So there you have it. One tiny snippet of one topic that we covered in this multi topic I don't even think that's a word, but we talked about a lot of things this podcast. So what you heard was just one very interesting side note on renewables. There's a lot more to come, so definitely check out this episode. Give it a listen. Spread it. Like us on Facebook. Share it around. I learned something. You can learn something. And without any more stalling and talking out of my ass, let's get into it. We live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? We've really got to start at the earliest levels with having a broader view of what education really can and should be. Because I find that with the young people we have, we are able to motivate them. Science is all around us. It's in us. Knowledge of science is power. It gives you an understanding of the forces of nature. It's not even about how much science you know. It's about how science literate you are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Imposter. Uh, today, we are recording live from Plymouth University, and we have a very special guest. Claire Embling is with us. Uh, and without further ado, I think we should just get right into it. So, uh, Claire, can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Plymouth? Well, um, I'm a lecturer in marine ecology, uh, which means that I do quite a lot of teaching on the marine biology and oceanography course, mostly, but I teach over all marine biology programs but also we do get to do some research as well and um, my research covers a range of topics from habitat modeling of marine vertebrates so marine vertebrates is um, uh, seals dolphins porpoises whales uh, seabirds and fish so it covers quite a lot my main speciality is with cetaceans so those that's the dolphins, whales, and porpoises. Sure. Um, so I like understanding where we find them, how they feed, um, 
and the oceanographic drivers that explain where they are. So, for example, why why tides drive, where you get foraging aggregations, you know, feeding aggregations of seabirds and seals and and whales. You know, what what is it underlying that? But I also look at um, human impacts. So, for example, things like marine renewables and how that's likely to impact marine organisms, especially um, cetaceans, um, and also uh, marine noise and how that affects marine life. Um, I, we will get into that because all those things are very interesting to me. Um, but kind of have to, I have to ask because it's always the kind of classic question. But how exactly did you get into this specifically then? Because it's not just like, oh, I have a love of marine biology, you know, like it's, it's fairly specific what you're kind of okay. focusing on. Okay, well, I've got quite an unusual background because actually I started off life as an engineer. Oh. An, an electrical electronic All engineer. All right. Wow, that is quite the difference. So uh, I did a degree in electronic, electrical electronic engineering. I worked for a number of years in um, railway signaling and in wow. <laughs> radio communications. I know that's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a good thing. <laughs> I did and, um, not expect that, though, I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then what happened was um, I was kind of like, well, you know, this is fine, but it's not really what I'm passionate about. And I went on, um, I took a gap six months, and I went traveling around the world, and I did some conservation work in the Philippines. Oh, wow. And, and then I went, just went all around the world, and I just decided that I wanted to do biology instead hmm. so then I came back and I started doing part-time study in biology at the same time as working oh, wow. and then I got um, a position at University of St Andrews on their master's in environmental biology and I was I I'm, I'm probably unusual in the marine field in that I just love biology yeah I would have been happily researching trees as well as marine oh. environment so I just love Ecology, especially, in general, so the yeah. study of the big picture of how thing, everything works together mm. in marine, in the, in, in the environment, in, in, yeah, in, the in, environment. in general, yeah. yeah. Um, it just so happened that there was a PhD going which combined acoustics um, oh. with uh, with biology, yeah. And because I had an engineering background, ah. um, I ended up doing my PhD using acoustics to listen for whales and dolphins and to understand their distribution, where they're found on the west coast of Scotland. So I then spent three years going around on a yacht and on bigger boats, towing a hydrophone, an underwater microphone under the water to listen to whales and dolphins. Wow. Um, and that's how I spent three years of my PhD or six months of each year of my PhD. So kind of as a follow up or a side note, but when you were kind of with the hydrophone listening for a while, did you, because as far as I understand, though, marine mammals are not my specialty, but they have different dialects as well, depending on where they're from between the populations? Okay, so so different uh, different um, marine mammals have different sounds. Right. So, for example, porpoises speak very high-pitched. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, they speak very high-pitched, so high-pitched that you can't actually hear porpoises. Really? Yeah, yeah, they're about oh, wow. 100. 120 to 140 kilohertz. So you can't actually hear them. Um, so we use software to, to be able to detect those. So like we have to be going through a yeah. computer. Yeah, like a dog whistle. Huh. Yeah, and then you've got um, animals like blue whales that, that are very Deep low. Very low. Yeah. So low we can't hear them. Hmm. So very low. They're about 20 hertz. So you've got a very wide range of frequencies. Sure. Um, I never picked up any blue whales, unfortunately, and we do have minke whales. But the, the other interesting thing, going back to the dialects, is so they all have different frequencies, so different sound pitches, but but um, but they also make noise to different amounts. So mm. so animals like minke whales, they'll only make sounds like during the breeding season, so you really? won't hear them most of the time. I think we had, in the whole time of working on the west coast of Scotland, I think there's been one recorded sound of a minky whale. Wow. It's called a boing sound. <laughs> Amazing name, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that makes it more difficult to hear them, obviously. Of course, so, yeah. so we couldn't really use acoustics for, uh, for minky whales. But then other animals like porpoises, they're using the sound all the time. And then, sorry, I haven't gone back to the dialects yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so animals like um, the odontocetes, the toothed whales, right. the ones that've got teeth, um, they, most of those, apart from porpoises, make um, a series of whistles. Really? Yeah, so they're using whistles. 
And these are the ones that have been shown to have dialects. So, for example, different bottlenose dolphin populations would have um, different kind of like languages, so to speak, different dialects. And also they've got individual names. So it's the work done by um, the team up in St Andrews, um, Vincent Yannick and team, that have looked at um, uh, dif you know, different um, anim animals having signature whistles. So each one having a name, we have right. a signature whistle for that animal. Huh. But then even sperm whales have dialects as well. And they just use a series of clicks, just like... So uh, and each dolphins as well, then, have their... The, so the dolphins have the whistles. They have right. clicks as well, as but just well. for finding... Well, we think it's just for finding prey and navigating. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that the echolocation? Yeah. Is the, yeah. And they have the kind of more of a hollow... Uh, is it, I might be getting completely wrong, but that it, that's where they bounce it off of? Yeah, right? they've got they've got um, very pronounced melon. Yes. You call it a yes, melon. Yes, a melon. That's, yeah. that's the term. For those <laughs> it's of you that not really know, a melon. <laughs> yeah. We're just kind of putting our hands on our heads right now. Um... <laughs> Okay, so I just had a quick question, and this kind of leads into your work, not necessarily, well, yeah, I guess, but when it comes to anthropogenic activity, um, when you're saying how the minkies communicate less, I guess, they're going to say something and they want to say it when it's important. Um, does that mean that when you have areas that have a lot of shipping noise and traffic or whatever, you know, coastal development? Would they be less impacted by that because they don't communicate as much, as far as we know? Or would they maybe be more impacted because when they do, it's in a pivotal kind of, it's, a, it's during, you said it was mating season or breeding season? I mean, a time that's actually important to be able to communicate. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, obviously, um, if if they have a kind of seasonal behaviour in, in using the vocalisations, then it might be more important, the noise levels at certain times of year than others. But some of these animals, like the minke whales and the blue whales, they use a very low frequency. Mm -hmm. And most of the frequencies of... So they're using very low pitch sounds. Right. Okay? But most of the shipping noise, as you gave an example there, use, is very low frequency. Right. The thing about low frequency is it travels very large distances. High frequencies don't travel so far. Very low frequencies can travel massive distances. Yeah. So, for example, blue whales, uh, we believe they can communicate over thousands of kilometres. Thousands? Yeah. Wow. Or maybe a thousand kilometres. That maybe. is nuts. That's so cool. But they've estimated that since the amount of world traffic, shipping traffic has increased, Jeez. that that, that c range of communication hmm. has reduced significantly. Because because of the amount of background noise there is, so that they're only being able to communicate over a hundred kilometres, and they they think they might use this for breeding, mm. you know, long distance communication for finding sure, the females. Yeah. So we don't we don't know what impact that sort of reduction of the range of communication has on animals. Have there been any other kind of compensatory techniques that we you know the leading research has observed between recorded calls, you know? Yeah, so some animals have been shown to change their frequency. Okay. So, um, now I can't remember which species it is, but one of those species, whether it's the blue whale or one of the other low frequency ones, has been sure. shown to increase the frequency of their calls. Oh, really? Some have been, there's some evidence to show that some animals, such as killer whales, will in increase the amplitude, so that how loud hmm. they're speaking. Yeah. So there's quite a few studies that have shown changes in their actual yeah. vocalisation patterns if you know what I mean the, yeah how, how they're talking how loud they're talking and how high so you know if you if you were in a very noisy environment you've got lots of cars going past you yeah. might st speak louder Fair you, enough. you might change the pitch of your voice to be heard it is though I, I would say maybe yelling would be more of an energetic cost than changing the frequency I could I mean from a human perspective. from a human perspective yeah I, I'm not a whale <laughs> No, so I've been called one, but. <laughs> All right, so that kind of leads into one of the other topics that I want to talk about and one that you kind of research as well, which is um, these anthropogenic um, impacts, these human impacts, and especially when it comes to kind of, well, you, you have your paper about the marine renewables um, that I found fascinating. Um, Actually, if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be ideal. Just talking, I guess, about 
the drive now for offshore wind farms, for example, but that, you know, it's, it's great to have renewable energies, but at what cost? Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, obviously, we need marine renewables as part of the important role in cl contact, uh, combating climate change. Mm -hmm. Wind is a great, great resource around the UK. Tide is as well. Tide sure. becoming become is beginning to get bigger. Is gro is growing in the UK. I think yesterday I saw that the the tidal uh, t turbine has test tidal turbine has just gone in in Ramsey in Wales. Oh really? I, I think I saw that yesterday on Twitter. That's pretty cool. So. Um, and there's been a device in in Ireland for a bit. So the so the saw, tidal, yeah, yeah, in Strangford yeah. Lock. So the tidal's moving on as well. Right. And obviously there's wave energy as well, but that's that's a little bit behind the other technologies. But wind is obviously the biggest mm -hmm. here. And um, the, the the one of the issues for um, marine mammals with um, wind turbines is that they have to be held on the bottom somehow. And one of the main methods in which um, you get these ter these massive, massive turbines to stand up in the middle of the sea is obviously you, you have to make a big hole in the bottom of the sea right. to put them in. Yeah. And the, the main way in which they do that is something called pile driving. So basically... <laughs> Sounds nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so basically you're taking a massive, generally metal pole right. and then you're just ramming it into the sea. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you know when you get those... Um, the jackhammers. The jackhammers. Yeah. It's a bit like one of those, but in the sea. So and it's massive. I'd assume as well, because sound travels faster, it, it makes quite the ruckus then. Um, yeah. Is, and I assume as well, it takes more than one day. It's, it's a very long-ish process, especially maybe in the beginning when we didn't have the technology kind of pat down and... Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of these wind farms are very big as well, so it's, it's, it's kind of um, a double issue. Um, it takes a while to put the pile in in the first place, and then you're talking about, I mean, you're talking about wind farms now, which are a ho over 100 turbines. Wow, yeah. So um, so you're thinking about, you're doing pile driving for quite a long period of time. Yeah. You'll have gaps in between. Um, so you think about that noise going into the marine environment, it's kind of like a big bang constantly. And it's been shown to displace um, porpoises, for example, hmm. which are in these habitats, because they're mostly in their shallow water habitat, which is prime habitat for, um, for porpoises. Right. And we've got a lot of porpoises. They're the most common species in our waters, harbour porpoises, the most common in the UK. Um, and... And it's shown to displace those hmm. for, for up to 20 kilometers. Is it displacement as well as, I mean, have they done blood testing to see stress levels, seeing cortisol levels or anything like that? I mean, Not as far as I know on the stress levels. Yeah. We don't know what the stress levels are. And we also don't know what the causes are of displacement. I mean, you know, well, are yeah. they being displaced from prime habitat that they need? So are they having to find other places to find to feed, for example? Right. Um, so we don't know what the popula population level impacts are, and that's that's the big question. We know we know they're being moved away, and we know that they get scared away from the sound. Yeah. We know that they do come back afterwards right. on the whole. There's, there's mixed results on that one. Um, but the the thing that I'm always concerned about is that these things are going on for quite a long time. Yeah. Then if you think about somewhere like the North Sea, you've got multiple wind farms going in at the same time. You've got cumulative impacts. Hmm. So if you think of these porpoises, they've got issues with bycatch. They're caught by fisher in fishing nets. Mm -hmm. Then they've got this noisy environment they're trying to escape. They've got a wind farm over there being put in, another wind farm over there. It's kind of like that cumulative impacts that we're worried about at the moment. Yeah. And there are models going ahead at the moment to try and work out what, what we think might be the population level impacts of those types of activities. Sure. Now, on an ecosystem level, is the prey of the porpoise, you know, if you go down the trophic levels or connect the different dots on a food web, you know, are they also being displaced as well? And if so, you know, you know, if they're not, actually rather, if they're not, this is something that I, obviously because I did sharks before, but you know, when you take the top predator out, there's, you can have a bottom down or a top down effect. So is there... 
It's interesting you say on the, there's not as much work being done on the actual impacts of safe. There's some done about um, hearing damage in fish from sure, power sure, driving. Sure. Displacement, there's not so much. There's a bit of work done on sand eels. What's, what are the impacts of wind farms on sand eels? Um, what I find, so there's, but there's not a huge amount on the fish side, which I think is a little bit lacking. We should be doing a bit more. Yeah. Um, what I find is quite interesting, though, there was a paper that came out last year that was um, uh, from seal tagging study. Hmm. And it was really, really neat. You should look up the, you should look up the, yeah. the video because okay. basically one of the harbour seals that they they tra tracked, which is one of the species we've got in the UK, it 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 went out and then it just went from it obviously went to a wind farm and there was obviously a lot of fish on this wind farm because you've got to think about it. The fishermen aren't allowed to fish around the wind farm. Fair enough. So yeah. you could say it's a de facto marine protected area because you're protecting all the fish in that area. And you saw this seal going from one turbine to the base of That's one amazing. turbine to another. You could actually see, you know, the, the network of where all of the turbines hmm. were. And this seal was using it, obviously. I mean, we've got, no, we haven't got the evidence that they actually fed, but the fact they like, kept returning yeah. to the piles. So that's, yeah, sorry. So obviously, long term, there, there is an ecosystem effect as well, because, you know, you've got fish there then afterwards. Yeah, well, that, that's... The, the next point I was going to bring up. So you have kind of these possible negative effects or these adverse effects, which is the actual installation of these, in this case, you know, the wind farms or the turbines. Um, but the after effects, it seems, you know, you have areas where fishing boats literally can't get in, even if they wanted to. Um, and, you know, you have maybe a lot of recruitment for kelp or, um, you know, mussels and oysters. And so the possibility for like you said, this artificial habitat to kind of proliferate. So is that something that comes into, uh, I guess, effect when you're making an assessment? Like, what, what, what is the actual cost and benefit? Yeah, well, I'm not involved in the assessment process itself, so I don't right. actually know whether that gets... Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so, from that perspective. Um, the assessment process will tend to, it, it does less on the long-term benefits, I think. Right, right. On the whole, my belief is that um, you look at the baseline, so what is the situation, What you know, how many animals are there, how much are they use in that right. area before, and that goes not just for marine mammals, but whatever it, exactly, part yeah, of the yeah, ecosystem yeah. we're talking about. Um, and then what happens during installation, you have to monitor. Okay, and then and then, it's my, my understanding that the operational side, once it's in, it's, it's in. Yeah. It's in. So I don't, I, I don't really, I don't think there's much on that on that side. That's not to say it wouldn't happen in future. But, yeah, yeah. But at the moment, I think it's more of the immediate impacts of, you know, what what are we doing by removing that habitat, and what impacts is it having immediately on those animals? I mean, I. As far as I know, the only the only things I've heard of once they're installed is you know with elasma breaks that have electroreception, chomping on the cables that actually bring it to shore. But that's that's a fairly niche kind of well. But anyway, it's it's interesting you bring up um, baseline because in your paper in the same paper I believe you were talking about the assessment process and you know. When you, I think you said that the UK is generally, um, you and your co-authors, the UK generally follows a lot of the EU regulations when it comes to kind of um, deciding MPAs and whatnot. But their definition of a baseline could, could have been the previous year. And so it's important to understand kind of why that, I mean, if you could expand on that, why a baseline is important and why to maybe have it be from multiple years that go maybe a bit further back than a 12-month period. Yeah, I mean, this is a debate that's been going on for a while. I mean, how long is a good enough baseline? Sure. And and also considering that the baseline that is there now is obviously not the baseline that's been in the past. Of course, of course, of course yeah. Everyone calls it the shifting baseline. It's, you need, the problem is, when you're trying to detect an impact, you need long enough to be able to, so is the wind farm or is the tidal turbine having an impact on the, the animals? 
what's actually quite difficult is that there's a lot of natural variability in populations, their patterns, their abundances, how much they use an area. So you need to be able to have a good idea of that. And I'm not sure, I'm not completely, con I'm not convinced that one year is enough, because mm. what we're talking about is something that changes with the environment. So if you think about, like, some years we have nice, hot, lovely summers, and nice, calm seas. Another time, another year, we might have a very, you know, poor weather. Sure. So we need, in an ideal world, you'd need enough understanding of the background, you know, how are animals responding to this background to be able yeah. to understand whether the changes that you observe when you put in a wind farm are actually due to the wind farm or are they due to natural variations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you were doing an installation during an El Nino year or just finishing it, you know, I know it's a drastic kind of example, but, you know, there are yeah. natural oceanic processes that... I mean, some things you can see immediate responses to, sure. like, you know, when you're putting the pile driving in, you can see an yeah. Im immediate response. But if you're talking about long-term impacts then it's actually very it's extremely difficult to detect have the power we call it the power to detect right an impact so that's actually really difficult to be able to do hmm. um as far as kind of the what the future looks like from you know your perspective or i guess you know what what you've gathered so far does it look like there will be a change to the way or, you know will there be a broader of assessment process or will people be taking more of the noise pollution into consideration I mean is there any way around it I guess um. Um, <clears throat> I mean the assessment program pro uh, the assessment process is based on European law and laws okay. always take time to change and this right. so I I don't think the process itself is likely to change okay however on the noise aspect and uh, noise is a recent addition to um, legislation before it wasn't considered in the legislation now noise is considered as pollution right. under the uh, marine strategies framework directive which is an e a European um, directive um, which means that we do now have to start monitoring noise levels and making sure that we keep them within good environmental status <laughs> what, whatever that means yeah, you know, right. because obviously we've got quite high noise levels already so how the challenge is how to define, yeah. you know, what is noise pollution? Is what we've got now the baseline <laughs> or the past? Yeah. Or, so there are a lot of challenges, but at least noise is now being considered as pollution and under, under law. Right. And would that be something that would also, you know, for engineers that are trying to kind of enhance or maybe make a better uh, model in the future, would they try and maybe implement it so that, you know, it's the least intrusive? Is that something that... Well, I mean, certainly with ship design, um, there's a, there's another organisation called the IMO, the International... <laughs> oh, Maritime Organisation. Okay, they've got uh, now guidelines for shipping. Okay. They're guidelines, so they're, they're, they're not mandated. You necessarily have to, right. But um, ships are being... There's a, quite, been quite a lot of work on trying to, to, to find out and acquire ship design. The main problem with the, the shipping industry is that, you know, boats are around for, you know, decades mm. and you can't just instantly turn around a whole fleet. So yeah. it's kind of like a 30 year process. Long transition. Yeah. It's a long process. But work is going on in, in that in that area. All right. So. Interesting. I'd like to maybe shift this maybe more towards MPAs. Um, and for those of you that don't know, that's marine protected areas. And I suppose what goes into assessing, what are the different factors and kind of predictors that, you know, you take into account when you're kind of looking at an area that you might designate a MPA? Okay, so it depends. There's different types of marine protected area. Right. So the most of the work that I've done um, has been for animals that are protected under the European Habitats Directive. Um, so there's a couple, the, there's a few marine mammals that are protected specifically under Annex Two of the ha of the Habitats Directive. Okay. And that's the harbour porpoise, bottlenose dolphin, grey seal, and the harbour seal. You know, I mostly work on the cetaceans. Right, right. And there are particular requirements for those species um, to be able to protect those habitats. So, for example, for the porpoises, you have to be able to show that 
if you're going to protect an area that they're there all year round, um, that they're in high densities in that area, so there's a lot of them, there's mm -hmm, a lot of them mm -hmm. in comparison to other areas, and also that they've got young, it's a nursing area. Okay. okay. So you've got to be able to demonstrate those, and if you can demonstrate those, then, then, then that's enough to be able to suggest it for a marine protected area. But it's, it is slightly different from that than from a bottlenose dolphin, because mm. a bottlenose dolphin, you can actually tell individuals from their dorsal fins. Really? So you can say, that's Bob, because he's got a, cut, a nick on his dorsal oh, fin. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do the same with sharks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can use techniques such as photo identification to work out residency patterns. So, mm -hmm. for example, George always hangs out. You know, well, there actually there is a George. Is there a George? There's a George. <laughs> there's a George in Plymouth Sound. He's a he's a unique bottlenose dolphin. He's just he's a solitary one, but um, huh. yeah. So you can tell whether they hang out in a certain area, and that they use an area a lot. And also, you can find out other um, information. You can work out how many there are because hmm. you know you can just count. You know, you've got the number yeah. of photos. Yeah. You can do use techniques such as mark recapture. To, to, to work out the abundance mm -hmm. and work out how many of the animals are in that area. And you can work out at home range and say, this animal uses this area, uses this nice tidal little part and this one there. And you can you can look at a lot of different factors, survival rates, you can look you can track you can track animals over time. So um, the work for example done in the Shannon Estuary on the dolphins over there, they've got dolphins who've been you know, seen over a twenty-year period using the same habitat, the really? same environment. So that's a diff that's hmm. a different thing because you can actually show that the animals are using the same area consistently. So you can say this is obviously an important area for the animals, and they should be protected. And so, site fidelity is the main. It, you know, as long as you can really prove that they come back to the exact same spot. So yes. this 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 would be, I guess, my question is that with kind of incorporating the predicted impacts of climate change on the ocean and whether that's you know warming or ocean acidification there might be changes to habitat so um, an area that might have been suitable could you know potentially in 20 years no longer be suitable but we have models that predict that where you might find you know, a more suitable area. Is that something that you can incorporate? Can you change an MPA to move with the, the model? I mean... Okay, so there's a couple of things you talked about there. And one of the things that I did when I was doing, recommending um, marine protected areas for harbour porpoises was I did something called a habitat model. Okay. And that's basically taking where I'd seen or heard porpoises and looking at some of the environmental uh, descriptors of why they're there. So, for example, we know that porpoises eat sand eels. So I put sand. Where are the sandy areas in my model? Yeah. Yeah. Because we think, well, That's you know, where a sand eel. Yeah. And be. we know that a lot. Of my analysis and quite a few other people's analysis have shown that tide is quite important for porpoises. So we do incorporate tidal variables sure. in there. So, like, this is a highly high tidal speed area. This is low tidal speed area. That sort of thing yeah, into yeah. models. Um, and then you can put other things in there like sea surface temperature from satellite imagery, um, chlorophyll levels, or you know anything that you like into right. those models. And that's what I used for defining the marine protected areas because then you can predict high density areas. Hmm. And if you use something, you know, if you use something like sea surface temperature, then it's possible that you could use it. And they've used it for some terrestrial animals to be able to predict in a climate change situation where populations might end up. Now, I'd say <laughs> I, I'm a little bit hesitant because obviously we're, we're missing a link here, and that's the fish. So what's important is fish, mm -hmm. okay? And most cetacean species and probably most marine mammal species, they're quite, you know, generalist. So they'll eat whatever's around. They're not, yeah. they're not fussy, you know. Well, they, they are but, a little bit fussy, obviously. Sure. They're like sand eels are nice and oily. But they might, you know, they they will There's change a squid their prey. That happens to be right there. They'll they'll change their prey on, depending on what's available. So sure. it's not as simple. It's not as simple as it moving with okay. sea surface temperature. Obviously, they might have thermal their own thermal preference for temperatures, but it's it's not. So I hesitate a little bit okay. towards saying that you could predict where they might end up. But but it's a useful tool, and it's been shown it's been shown to work with other with other species. 
As to moving marine protected areas, that the way in which marine protected areas are set up at the moment is they're static. So there needs to be some sort of change in the way that marine protected areas are set up and managed to be able to have dynamic, what we call dynamic ocean management. And there is work going on in that area. There's, some recent, um, there's a recent paper that's come out looking at dy dynamic ocean um, management to try and, and look at some of these issues and having marine protected areas perhaps that are dynamic and move in time and space. But I don't think we're quite there yet. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's a valid question. That area that you define for marine protected areas, because one of the things I didn't say was you had to show that it was consistently used over time as well. Right, right. So, for example, the analysis I did for harbour porpoises, I showed that over a three-year period, which isn't that long, the porpoises were consistently used in the same area, repeatedly, year on year. Hmm. It would be interesting now that there's... 10, 11 years worth of data for those porpoises right. to see whether that's still the case. Hmm. Um, so, kind of on the same note, but um, are, are porpoises and dolphins, are they, do they migrate at all? I mean, do they cover large bodies of water? I mean, I know a lot of whales tend to, um, which I guess my train of thought right now is that would you have like a seasonal MPA where in the times that they're not there, fishermen could go in or, you know, whoever. It could be a recreational area. Or, I mean, is that something that also is kind of... Yeah, that, that could work as well. And um, I don't know that that actually happens uh, with dolphins or porpoises at the moment. Um, but certainly there are seasonal variations in, in use of these areas. Sure. So, for example, I know that with porpoises there is a summer winter variation in numbers mm. though we've got very little data in the winter because the weather's so bad nobody goes out and has a look so just kind of like ad hoc kind of like observations we know they're there and also uh, passive acoustics is quite good for looking at some of these patterns so you can passive acoustics basically listening so you can put listening devices down okay um that listen for the animals and um I've, i did some work with the university of exeter um, using something called a sea pod, which is basically a click detector for detecting porpoises and dolphins around, well, wherever. It can only detect them within about a 500 metre radius. But around Cornwall, it's interesting, for example, that porpoises uh, are recorded much more during the winter than during hmm. the summer. So oh, wow, you, really? Yeah, so you could imagine... Um, you could imagine that there could be some sort of seasonal you know, management. And certainly that, that we know that that happens with fish and, um, hmm. you know, other marine protected areas. Are those recorders continuously going or are they triggered by, like, motion or...? Yeah, no, these ones, they record continuously. Oh, wow. um, and because they're only recording the clicks rather than uh, the whole recording of the animals, um, they can sit there for four months and record data. Wow, that's... Pretty cool. Yeah, and then and then there's some really exciting developments of some of the acoustic recorders because now you can actually record noise levels for a long period of time. You don't record hmm. continuously. What you do is that over an hour you'll you'll like make a couple of five minute recordings or whatever. Right, right, right. Um, but now we're m beginning to monitor noise levels and we can record some of the other sounds as well, like hmm. the, the whistles as well. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, that's pretty nifty. Yeah, so so that's beginning to happen a lot more as well. Now. Well, on, on the note of kind of the future of bioacoustics or the technology, rather, um, where do you see this field in general going? Though, I mean, uh, is that is that too dicey? No, or? no, it's quite exciting actually because um, there's a couple of developments which I find quite exciting. Um, one of them is is putting actual acoustic recorders on animals. Oh. Okay, so we can hear the noise that they can hear. Okay, yeah. that that is beginning That's to cool. Yeah, yeah, it's now beginning to happen. The, the the software is in that kind of like, you know, kind of like testing arena at the moment. Sure. So so they're putting de they're putting devices on. Uh, so for example, seals, and they'll hear what they can hear. Now I say that. I say that's in a testing because I'm talking about long term because they've had something called D tags for a while. I don't know what the D stands for actually, but they're <laughs> acoustic tags that they they put on a sucker. So that oh, for, yeah, yeah, for yeah. large whales, they've been using them for like beaked whales, mm -hmm. and they they kind of like sucker them on. So they kind of like go. <laughs> Is it like one of those the bathtub? Uh, <laughs> yeah, like the like... bathtub suckers. Yeah. All right. So okay. they kind of like that they've works. got a kind of like I don't know if you. 
uh, anyway, the, the hunt at the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that episode. With the they... blue whale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've got kind of like this long harpoon thing, but it's not for killing them. It's just basically got the sucker yeah. with a device attached to it. And they stick it to the whale and it goes on the whale for a few hours. And then they can record the sounds that they make. Now, they were using those for okay. recording um, sounds especially to do with foraging, feeding behaviour okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. of animals such as beaked whales, which are very uh, rare deep diving species. But now they're getting recorders that you can stick on animals for much longer, which is what I'm really interested in, because um, I've just got a PhD student who started um, trying to understand seal behaviour in relation to shipping noise. Hmm. So she's um, doing noise propagation models of shipping noise, and then we've got... Um, seal tag behavior which is just showing the depth and their position to to sure. work out what they're likely to experience from the propagation models hmm. but what we what would be even nicer would be to have actual data from the seal yeah. knowing what they can hear that would be amazing yeah and that is beginning huh. to happen the other exciting development is hmm. something called gliders which is basically underwater robots so you basically uh, send this autonomous yeah yeah autonomous devices okay so we this is a recent development as well. They've got these new autonomous devices. Well, these little—I call them underwater robots because it sounds so much more exciting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> got these underwater robots which just go off into the sea for quite a long time. It can be months. They're just—they're just—they're just full of lots of different instruments, and they have developed acoustic recorders for going on these. So they're recording the That's sounds amazing. that they collect. So they can find out, you know, what the noise... I mean, obviously the glider itself might be a little bit noisy, so I'm not quite sure what sort of noise levels they'd be able to detect yet, mm. but in future. Hmm. Uh, but definitely um, uh, marine mammal, you know, vocalisations. Yeah, well... And it's, it's you know, just send it out and you can listen to that's sounds. That's so cool. Yeah. Is it is it solar-powered? Yeah. If it can, if it's out some, there for months at a time, yeah. Some assume. of the, the some of the surface ones are yeah. solar powered. I'm not sure about the ones that I don't know how they're. I don't you know. Get like I a don't turbine, know the like magnetic turbines <laughs> on the side there. Um, <coughs> oh, very cool. Uh, that sounds exciting in in terms of you know, where it's heading. And is that just going to be kind of shared open source raw data, or is it? Universities and institutions yeah, sponsoring it'll be, a glider. That, yeah, it'll be universities. Right. Um, data. Yeah. So, so I just need to collaborate with people. Yeah, right. Just <laughs> but it seems like it, it really like that opens a lot of doors. So, I, potentially because yeah, and because I'm very interested in in like for example oceanography and how that influences where feeding happens as well as the noise aspects. The thing I like about the gliders that I find really interesting, and and to do with putting the tags on the seals, sure. is not just the noise impacts, but but that overall understanding of, you know, the, a lot of these gliders are having other equipment on them. So, for example, they're measuring the sea temperature, they're, me they're measuring things like plankton. Yeah, then, I was going to say a CPR on it or something. Yeah, yeah. some of them have even got um, things that are able to detect fish. Huh. So you're cool. going to be able to get this big picture of what's going on in the in the sea to understand everything that's going on. And from the seal perspective, you'll be able to hear where the noise is, but also you'll be able to look at their, their feeding behaviour as well. Hmm. So how the noise influences their feeding behaviour or it influences where they go. Um, so it's that kind of like the integrated, you know, understanding of how everything works together. It's quite exciting. And it is very exciting. It's almost as if they could have sent a rover of some sort to this <laughs> this planet before another planet. But hey, there you go. I guess space exploration has its value. So we're coming sort of to the end. We're getting there. I just have maybe two more points. One, um, you had another study that I love because citizen science is something I'm passionate about. Um, first off, just to, I guess, my definition, but please correct me, you know, or add. But uh, citizen science, for those of you that don't know, is the involvement of the public um, into kind of, in this case, long-term experiments. I don't know if that's... Yeah, it's basically using members of the public to help collect data. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, for, for answering questions that are useful for conservation or for science. Yeah. Um, and so Claire had a had a study where 
Um, it was for bottlenose dolphins. Is that yes. It? Yes. And um, you're using citizen science in assessing how how robust, but also how much effort it would take. And the conclusion was that it, it depends on how many sightings you have in an area, but essentially, citizen science is valuable. Yeah. It is. Yeah, um, it was. It was really. Ex it was really good actually because I don't. Um, in many fields, there's a lot made of citizen science. So, for example, the bird world. They use yeah. a lot of citizen scientists. So you've got a lot of people out there. You know, when you do your garden bird watch, all of that sort of data is helpful for yeah. trying to understand the state of British birds. And then the RSPB State of Nature report, mm -hmm. a lot of that was based on citizen science projects. You was know? it? Yeah, a lot of the data from that. Yeah. So yeah. everyone out there who's recording data for any, uh, any organisation on any organisms, that data is being useful for, for understanding the state of our populations. So, so the, I was contacted by the Well and Dolphin Conservation Group. I was work, I've worked with them quite a bit before anyway. Mm. And they, they had these, they'd set up this fantastic long-term sightings program around the Murray Firth, which has now been extended around the rest of Scotland, uh, for monitoring the bottom, that one was for monitoring the bottlenose dolphin population in the Murray Firth, but more generally cetaceans, but it's mostly bottlenose dolphins in that area. So they wanted to know, well, how many watches do they need to do? Do they need to stand there continuously, watch, 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 <laughs> and all these poor volunteers wilting from all the efforts? So how much effort do they actually need to do? And that's that's what I did. I just looked at the data they've been collecting because some of the locations they've been collecting a lot of data. They've been there every hour of the day, you oh, know, wow. every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's some very determined volunteers out there. <laughs> And, and so it was a, we were able to show, because there's a clear trend in an increase in the bottlenose dolphins seen, hmm. for example, at Spay Bay, which is where their dolphin centre's based. Oh, wow. Um, and you could see this clear trend. So you, And also between sites around Murray Firth, you could see clear, clear differences in the number of bottlenose dolphins. So it was a good data set because it had been like nearly 10 worth, years worth of data for, for evaluating how much effort was enough. And it is actually quite a lot of effort that is required yeah uh, but it depends what you're trying to look for so for example they're quite interested in understanding what is the impact of putting a wind farm in near to the special area area of conservation which is the marine protected area of bottlenose dolphins in the murray firth so they wanted to know how much effort they're going to need to spend to be able to detect any change right that might be due to the wind farm mm -hmm. so for that area it's quite important to be able to detect a change within, say, a year. If you right. were looking for longer term changes, then you don't need quite so much effort. And then some of these, some of the programs that are done by citizen scientists, we're just looking at ranges. So then you, you don't need quite as much effort for doing, for understanding ranges. You just need to be able to do enough to be able to have a good idea of the range of a species. So that requires a lower lo level of, of effort. But mostly I was looking at it for being able to detect an impact, say, for example, from a wind farm. Yeah. And, you know, it's not to say, just like everything, it has, you know, its downsides changing in observers and, you know, I guess for dolphins, is it identifying that it's actually a dolphin? Yeah, I mean, it requires, yeah. you know, it requires a good training program. Exactly, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they have a training program that all of their volunteers undergo to make sure that they know what a bottlenose dolphin <laughs> looks like or any other cetacean looks yeah, like. Yeah, that's it. I'm really impressed by the volunteers, though. I did a talk to... Um, I did a remote webinar talk, oh, cool. talk to the volunteers and there's some very dedicated volunteers there that live on huh. very remote places that go out regularly really? to, to, to look for cetacean. And some, they will go out there regularly even though they don't see anything, which I think mm. is, that's one of the challenges of, of working with marine mammals is that, you know, you can be out there quite a long, a lot of time and you don't see anything. So it can be yeah. a little bit dispiriting. But then it's worth it when you see them. So, yeah, but it requires quite a lot of determination. Yeah, I can imagine. To, it's not like you look in your garden and you see loads of birds. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, the reason I'm so passionate is because in my undergrad, um, I had my professor of animal behavior. She did a whole thing with squirrels. That was her niche, but it was all about like, oh, have you seen a red squirrel? Have you seen, you know? Um, but I suppose... In the future as well, you know, you have, we have almost everybody has a smartphone now, and probably more people have it in the coming years. 
you, you get an app, you download an app that you can just have. I mean, you know, I have a shark tracker on my phone that I can see what, you know, Great Whites and the California coast are doing, you know. So it, it's the accessibility, I suppose, that is exciting from my perspective. I don't know if you yeah, care no, to comment it is on great Because I started, a few years ago, I started downloading lots of apps for recording different types of animals because yeah. you can do ones for... We've got slow worms in our compost heap, so you can record them in one really? different app. You could, so, there was a project. Wow. There was a project going on um, monitoring. I think it was magpies. It was a magpie app, huh. so I was recording my uh, magpies as well. You know, so it's yeah, it's great. It's really good. You can feel like um, you know, you can whatever project you like to do. Yeah. And there's also another thing called Zooniverse. Have you come across that Zoo one? I've never heard. Of, I'll have to write and that's that down. Where, actually, that's, that's where members like... of the public can help in a computer-based science projects. So, for example, if you like plankton, which yeah. I think I'm a big fan of plankton. Who isn't? Yeah. Um, a few people. There's, in Zooniverse, there's a plankton ID where you can go through. It gives you a little bit of training, and then you go through and you do some ID. And so it's like, they, you know the ones where you have your computer running in the background to process where is the first life yeah, yeah, planet yeah, with yeah. another life on? It's just, they're just using you. You can do oh, wow. ones for whale sound recognition really? as well. You can listen through different sounds and say what you think they are. That's so cool. So there's there's quite it, there's quite a lot of you know involving the public in helping you analyze your data as well, which is it's quite good fun. And there was one where you had to count the number of penguins or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. That could be fun. Um, so there are benefits. Is is the it's long cheap. short story? <laughs> as well. And it's cheap. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, it, I, and you know, as an academic, can you speak a little bit to kind of the environment that you know you need you need to have funding basically to do your research, and that that's kind of a key key part of it, but doesn't always come as often as from what I understand. This is like you know, I'm I'm just a beginner now, but yeah, no. So so everything we do has to be funded because obviously you know research doesn't get done without any money to do it. Um, and th some things are a lot more expensive than others. So the advantages of things like citizen science is that we can collect data fairly cheaply, and so then we just need enough money to be able to analyse the data. But other things like the things I get excited by, like gliders, you know, or putting tags on seals, yeah. you know, that, that requires a lot more money, you know, to be able to do that research. So, yeah, that's one of the big things that we're always doing is chasing after money <laughs> to be able to do our research. Yeah. yeah and it's not, it's get, it gets harder because obviously... Really? Because, you know, we keep clumping, the government keeps clumping. A lot of the money comes from government. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so the government keeps making cutbacks. So, you know, the, the pot of money gets smaller. <laughs> yeah, and it's shared amongst different fields, isn't it? Yeah. So money's always hard to, hard to get. Yeah. yeah. It is interesting because they don't tell us that. I don't know what your experience was when you were going up the ladder, but until this, you know, until doing a master's, was you you wouldn't even really hear about like, oh yeah, you need you need grants. I'm like what? Grant? Um, anyway, uh, so we'll we'll wrap it up. I guess uh, the I I kind of furthered an agenda by probing you about citizen science, but it works out because you did the study anyway. But that, you know, part of this podcast is to really engage the public, the general public, into the sciences. And um, I think that citizen science is a great way, you know, for people to participate in that. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important because, uh, you know, the marine, envir marine environment, the environment in general is really important. And unless we engage the, everyone, then we're not going to win this battle, are we? So it's incredibly important. And that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the really good things about doing science communication like this, but also for citizen science, is that it's getting people involved and caring about their environment. Yeah. And unless we have that, then we're not going to be able to... Well, you're widening the stakeholder approach, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. Um, while you have the podium, no pressure, but <laughs> is there anything that you'd like to say, communicate, or promote, or, you know, you don't have to. I, <clears throat> I guess uh, this is totally kind of like a little bit off topic. Go one thing I'm feeling quite passionate about is making kids get into the, env the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is really important. I've got two young daughters, and they're our future generation. So we really need to get them outside, experiencing nature, teaching them about nature, yeah. getting them on forest schools, getting them out in woods, getting them to Rock see, pooling. to see animals. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, I think that's really key. 
yeah. yeah. And us as scientists, we need to go out into schools and and talk to them about it as well. So. I could excellent way <laughs> to end. Excellent point. Um, I think education is key. But yeah. Getting that interest early on. Yeah, you said it perfectly. Um, well, listen, Claire. Thank you very much for joining us. On That's this, all right. Uh, lovely it's podcast. been a pleasure. It's been lovely speaking to you. Definitely learned a lot. So. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, until next time.